Yeah. And I mean, just to kind of nip it in the butt right away is like, we don't, we don't require any type of um, background in remodeling to be part of kitchen solvers. Uh, it's kind of uh, backwards thinking for what most people <clears throat> would assume, but we, we almost, when, when people come to us with the skill set already in remodeling, they have a lot of bad habits and it's hard to get them away from those old bad habits. And so what we're looking for are people that are, are have that management experience, but are really good communicators uh, have really high emotional intelligence. And so they, they, in stressful situations, they're not one to freak out and to kind of just, you know, start throwing darts at a board without properly thinking them through. Um, and then also it, it's kind of a, a word that we've been really using a lot in our sales process, but we're looking for someone with some grit, you know, someone when you're, when your back's up against the wall, what are you going to do? You know, are you going to, you know, fold up? Or are you going to like really push down that pedal harder, hire the right people, go after it and, and kind of work longer hours? Um, because I, I like to think that you know, starting a business is always uh, rainbows and butterflies, but there are going to be some tough times. Welcome to the Franchise Founders Podcast. We are on a mission to help aspiring entrepreneurs just like you take action through franchise ownership. Allowing you to obtain more financial freedom, time with family, and ultimately a business that can run on its own without you. Coming in live from my apartment, the Franchise Founders <laughs> Podcast. What's going on, everyone? Christian and I were in, and Zach, our guests, were just chatting. We we're talking about how we need a new intro because we keep starting it off the exact same way. But uh, we'll work on that. Christian, how are you doing today? It's one way to do it, man. Also live from my apartment here in Santa Clarita, California. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't sound quite as cool as Manhattan, but but it's the truth. What's up, Zach? That sounds pretty cool. <laughs> hey, what's going on, guys? Yeah, I think like a, a perfect tagline just to kind of like jumpstart things. It could be your new brand. You know, something along those lines would be perfect. Yeah, I know Brad yeah. Lee from the Dropping Dropping Bombs podcast. He always opens it up with what it is, and that's that's his thing. <laughs> and he starts it exactly that way every single time. So we got to figure out what that is for us, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's T-shirts, like, everything, hats, whatever you needed. <laughs> you ever see like a comedian when they they that's like got to be hard. They go on stage and they just have to open up, mm -hmm. you know, talking to random people. Yeah, I don't envy that position by any means. No, nope. uh, yeah. But with all that said, Zach, I mean, we're today's not about us. It's about you. It's about learning about the brand. Mm -hmm. So, so tell us about yourself and. And uh, then we'll dive into the brand, of course. But uh, yeah, so what's your background and how did you get into franchising? Yeah, sounds good. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Uh, so it, there's my introduction into franchising was uh, more or less by happenstance. Um, uh, our home office is in a small town in Wisconsin called La Crosse. Uh, it's a little river town along the Mississippi, about two and a half hours from Minneapolis. And um and so it, it being a small, small community, uh, we know a lot of people. Um, and uh, in 1982, that's where Kitchen Solvers was founded here in La Crosse. And, uh, uh, and in 2010, new ownership took over. Uh, and through a few small connections, I kind of landed myself into, into franchising. Um, Kitchen Solvers is the, is the brand, obviously. Uh, I don't have a remodeling background, but I had a, a really strong background in operations, manufacturing, lean manufacturing, Six Sigma, all that fun stuff. And so I took a lot of that knowledge, uh, a few connections, and that's what kind of got me into um, kind of the operational side of, of Kitchen Solvers. And it's been, it's been a wild ride since. Um, so I've been here for almost nine years. I've been president for uh, just about six years uh, of just Kitchen Solvers. Um, I started another brand in 2017 and then sold that in 2019 as well. Um, but yeah, it's a it's franchising is a, a perfect space and I definitely have found uh, my calling. I love love being in franchising. It's such a fun space to be in. Mark, I'll just quick edit. Mark, that would be a great place to put um, like some build up music as, as Zach told his uh, told his story. Uh, all right, back to it. So, so Zach, um, first of all, incredible, incredible background. I have to understand. So while president of Kitchen Solvers, you mentioned launching a whole other brand in 2017 and then uh, selling it in 2019. I mean, yeah, you said that so casually. That's, that's incredible. Yeah, it, it was fun. And I think just more for like my credibility and being able to build a brand, also being able to say that I've also sold a brand, uh, it just allowed me to kind of really 
help our franchisees also kind of throw that whole story together. So as our franchisees are coming in, they're starting new businesses, they're scaling them and they're they're at some point on them. I always like to have that experience to be able to talk and, and tell my story so that I can share that experience with them. And so in 2017, um, we I started a brand called Kitchen Wise. So in the kitchen space, uh, it's a product that we uh, had been selling at that time under the Kitchen Solvers name, but we kind of rebranded and repackaged it uh, and turned it into more of a, a smaller ticket, uh, higher kind of higher pressure type of sales, um, and it focused strictly on just the organization of of of, of cabinetry, and so. Um, in 2019 is also kind of when Kitchen Solvers started also kind of uh, uh, re-emerging and taking off. Um, and then uh, it just got to be a lot. And, and the offer that came up, I just couldn't turn it down. So uh, we ended up selling it to uh, premium service brands and they've been flourishing with it ever since. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with KitchenWise. That's that's cool. I wasn't aware of the, uh, the story there. So yeah, buyers yeah, just came along and it was just too good to pass up. And you said, all right, let's do it. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, again, making connections and telling people kind of what you do. And uh, they, they loved it. It fits right in with their uh, lead generation and all their brands. Uh, this is, it's Sometimes it's a little bittersweet to see see that see my brand uh, go across LinkedIn as, you know, another territory sold. And I love the, the, the brand image. We spent a lot of time building that. Uh, so sometimes I feel like it's still my baby. But at the same time, uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm glad it's in good hands. And uh, we're doing well here at Kitchen Stars, which makes it all that much better. I think, yeah. As, oh, sorry. I think as an entrepreneur, like having that exit behind you allows you to be an even better leader, right? Because you understand, mm -hmm. um, I, you're able to detach yourself from uh, the day to day and the emotional side. You probably know, like you said, it was your baby, but then you you sell and it's it's no longer your baby. You sold it to someone else, and so yeah, uh, I think it gives you a different vantage point as a leader. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, I take more or less that same philosophy every time we uh, launch new vendors or or bring new processes into our franchisees. Like, I always want to be kind of the one kind of pioneering that relationship so that I can speak about my experiences directly and also be like, hey, I've done this, I've seen this, and and here's my experience. Let's learn learn and grow with that. And so anywhere I can insert myself in the process, uh, I think it makes us uh, yeah all better as leaders and also just kind of teachers, I guess. Yeah, and I'm sure it helps also having the exit under your belt because now I think with, with Kitchen Solvers, I don't, I don't know what the plan is, obviously, but it's always good to have the possibility of an exit at, available, of course. And so you can build it with the with the end in mind and know that, mm -hmm. you know, I, I know what it takes to really maximize the value of the brand, the multiple, and really all of that boils down to helping the franchisees win and, and franchisee profitability and providing them with the support they need. And uh, ultimately what that means is that drives royalty revenue for you guys. So I think that mm -hmm. that's some really helpful insight to have. So it's always important to the audience to, to know what the leadership background is for the, for the franchisors you're checking out because uh, it's, a, you know, it's important that they have relevant experience and Zach, you, obviously you do. So, um, so, I mean, I guess let's, let's dive into the brand a little bit. Kitchen solvers. Yeah. Who are you guys? What do you do? And uh, why you guys versus, the competition yeah for sure um you know kitchen solvers has uh, been around longer than i've been alive <laughs> so it's that we have that definitely that established brand uh feel and a lot of people know who kitchen solvers is um and i you know we, i used to call us kind of a, a re-emerging uh brand uh we've definitely have been a, a emerging but we've been around now for quite a bit of years under new ownership uh new processes all that fun stuff. But uh, Kitchen Solvers started in 1982. And we kind of pioneered what we called uh, refacing and it's still a, a big, big product line for us now. Re refacing is simply taking your existing cabinetry, tearing all the doors and drawer fronts off that cabinet. Uh, then we take a very thin veneer and we basically essentially glue uh, the, that new veneer to the face frames of the cabinetry, order new door fronts and drawer fronts and accessories. And we make your existing layout look brand new completely refreshed. And so it's a, it's a great uh, product line, not only for us to um, uh, kind of uh, stay within their space and, and do a little bit more on a smaller budget, um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an awesome product line for, for a lot of different reasons. 
Um, then we also get into full scale kitchen remodeling. Uh, we can do some redooring as well. Uh, but anything within the kitchen space, uh, that's that's kind of where our home is. Um, and so a lot of our franchises, they really embody that, uh, all those different product lines. And I think with a lot of different uh, kind of waves in the economy, uh, different product lines kind of flourish. Uh, and so having that uh, flexibility within that product line really helps us out. Um, also in 2010, what we kind of noticed too is when new ownership took over, Kitchen Stores was originally built on kind of that that one person that I'd love to install. They're woodworkers. They kind of built the business around themselves. But when it came to sell their business, there just wasn't anything for a new owner to buy. Uh, they, they didn't really come in the package. They were leaving. And so we definitely saw that and we were like, well, we need to find ways to, to kind of start with the end in mind and, and grow and scale that business. And so that came with a lot of new processes to add infrastructure, add people. We, we expanded our product lines uh, and uh, expanded our marketing platforms to really build that big business that they could say in 10 years, 15, 20 years, I can now have something to either pass out to my kids or uh, sell to somebody else. And I can remove myself from that day to day and 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 still allow uh, kind of what I built to, to flourish. So there's there's been quite a bit of transformation in, in the last probably 10, 10 to 12 years. Uh, again, more focused on that infrastructure of the business. So um, from a product standpoint, everything kitchen remodeling, um, uh, from a business support, obviously we have all the different support with uh, new state-of-the-art training centers and um, uh, new, new uh, I guess, like fleet vehicles and tool packages and all that type of stuff so that when our franchisees come here, they're basically leaving leaving training with a, a ready-to-go business. And I think that, that that's what really makes us different is we're business in a box, ready to, ready to go right after training. I think it's thank you first of all for sharing the the business and I, I think you know going back to that topic of of sales or exiting a business you know I think that like not just franchising but just business ownership education in general kind of doesn't do the greatest job talking about selling and what selling a business is like and you know mm-hmm. I was thinking of that when we're talking to franchise candidates I think a lot of people forget about the sale component they think well I'm going to replace no, right. my income and more work-life balance, but they forget that they could sell their business for a multiple of what they're earning mm-hmm. uh, and could be a substantial return on or retirement um, income. So do you feel like within your brand as a leader, since you have the experience, um, are you, are you guys educating or uh, at least, you know, advising your franchisees that this is a potential that they can do in their, in their plan, in their long-term plan? Yeah, that, to be honest, I, I almost think that you're doing a little bit of a disservice if you're not talking about that. Uh, and on that first day of training, uh, we we walk through um, obviously the 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 culture of the business uh, and 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 the the different vision for what they have in their business. We walk through a break even, and then we start talking about exactly what they want to do in ten years. You know, what is that ten year goal for you? Uh, do you have young kids that you want to be a part of the business at some point? Do you want to, do you want to sell it? What do you want to sell it for? And so we have that conversation on the first day of training. Uh, so it allows us to kind of back into our, our, uh, monthly and yearly goals, uh, starting year one. Um, we also then revisit that same topic <clears throat> a lot. And this year at our, our, at our upcoming conference, we're going to be having a, a round table uh, that, that talks about selling your business. What does it entail? What, what are some of the multiples that people are seeing? How do you get your business ready? Um, because we've had a lot of those, those guys that I was talking about earlier that kind of built the business around themselves. They kind of saw this new model start to take shape and they were still around. And they're like, you know, I, I just wish that I would have known this stuff back prior. And I wish I would have started a kind of my business uh, with, with the infrastructure and being able to build in layers of people so that I could sell it for something. Uh, right now, it's just me. and There's nothing to nothing to sell at this point. So it's, it's a huge point that we start off of day one. Yeah. And I think that that should also start even in just the, the franchise development process and with the consultant as well, assuming that there's a consultant yeah. in the mix. That needs to be part of the conversation. I mean, I've been reading books about this subject religiously. I'm reading right now the $100 million exit <laughs> by uh, Jonathan Braband. He's an M&A advisor, obviously for much higher companies, but a lot of the same principles apply. You want to have a management team in place. If the business just relies on you 100%, you don't really have a business, you have a job. Now, you could have a high-paying job, lots of job satisfaction, be your own boss, call your own shots, 
and have some flexibility. But if, again, if you want to have something that's saleable someday, you do need to build that infrastructure. And it's good to do that from the beginning so that once you reach that, or even as you're building the business, if like w- with what happened to you, if somebody comes along and says, hey, I'd like to buy your business, it's in a position where it can command the highest possible valuation. So um, for sure. So I think that's fantastic. You guys have that conversation and the fact that you've had that experience, no doubt. Yeah. It's, it's funny too, because when you first like start that conversation with the new franchise owner, they get it. They're like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing any of the work. I'm going to hire people and whatever else. Then they actually get into the, the real world of the business and they might find out that, Hey, actually, you know, I, I like selling kitchens or I like managing these projects or I like getting my hands dirty in the field. And then at that point, it kind of, there's red flags that start going off in our heads. And we're like, we need to remove you from this process as quickly as possible. Because once you kind of get in that daily routine and you, you, you then think that you're the only one that can actually do that portion of the, of the, of the work. And so then it's very hard to find someone else then to come in and replace that. And then it, that and we, I've seen it where it takes two, three, four years for them to remove themselves as a sales guy because they think that they're the only ones that can do it the right way. Um, so, if, but if you start from that first two or three months hiring those people that to, to kind of step in, it makes that transition so much easier uh, in the long run to, to kind of remove yourself from that day-to-day work. Yeah, that, I mean that's 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 no doubt about that. I mean it's 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 critical, and you just have to. It's easy to get comfortable, I think, for a lot of franchisees, and you're, you're making money, mm-hmm. you're happy. But again, if you want to have something that's going to be there long term that can exist without you, then you do need to put that in place. So, makes for sense. Sure. Um, so I'm thinking like. I'm, I'm just, I'm biting my nails because I'm thinking about my, my new company here, Franchise Playbook. We have um, no revenue. We just started, right? We have a, mm-hmm. a director of operations, director of marketing, a CFO, this whole executive team. And everything's so crazy that I went and did that first, but I know it's what's you know going to allow me to not be stuck in the day to day. But every like week I get the payroll report and I want to like, <laughs> jump out of this window behind me because it's like, what the hell am I, you know, what the heck am I doing paying all these people? But, you know, it's interesting because- it's true. Like, you know, you might be able, maybe you can sell better than the guy or gal you hire by 10%. But you know what? Five people selling is at 90% of your skill is better than you selling one, you know, one person mm-hmm. selling at 100%. Uh, and the truth is, you're not that much better. Like, you can find a better salesperson, you can better, find a better, in, you know, really every role. That's mm-hmm. good a lot of times, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and you yourself, you're not scalable. <laughs> There's only one of you. You can only be at so many places at one time. Whereas if you have a team of people that even have half your level of skill, but you can do a tremendously larger amount of volume because they can simply be at more places at once than you can, even if the closing ratio is much lower. Mm-hmm. And the true so, testament is going to be how good of a manager are you of people in order to allow them to flourish in their jobs and allow them to, to be better at what they do so that you can focus on X, Y, and Z over here. Uh, and that's, that's the biggest differentiator, I think, for a lot of people is, is, is really focusing internally on management. Exactly. So, I mean, so let's talk about that then. Let's talk about some of the skills that are necessary for a franchisee to have coming in, coming to the table. They say, like the brand, I like the concept of kitchen solvers. It seems great. But what sort of skills do I need to bring to the table in order to be successful here? So obviously management skills, uh, but what mm-hmm. other types of skills and and what do you typically look for in a franchisee to know if they're the right fit? Yeah, and I mean, just to kind of nip it in the butt right away is like we don't we don't require any type of um, background in remodeling to be part of Kitchen Solvers. Uh, it's kind of uh, backwards thinking for what most people <clears throat> would assume. But we we almost when when people come to us with the skill set already in remodeling, they have a lot of bad habits, and it's hard to get them away from those old bad habits. And so what we're looking for are people that are are have that management experience but are really good communicators, uh, have really high emotional intelligence. And so they, they, in stressful situations, they're not one to freak out and to kind of just, you know, start throwing darts at a board without properly thinking them through. Um, and then also it, it's kind of a, a word that we've been really using a lot in our sales process, but we're looking for someone with some grit, you know, someone when you're, when you're backed up against the wall, what are you going to do? You know, are you going to, you know, fold up? Or are you going to like really push down that pedal harder, hire the right people, go after it and, and kind of work longer hours? Um, because I, I like to think that uh, starting a business is always uh, rainbows and butterflies, but there are going to be some tough times. 
Um, and just like you, Dan, what you said, I got that first payroll and it's scary, you know, but what are you going to do? You're not going to say, all right, I'm getting rid of my direct director of marketing. I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to keep, keep, uh, keep that fire going. And so, uh, we've been using the, the word grit quite a bit when we're, when we're looking for our candidates. Um, and so that, and that's, again, when I fo focus back on the management side of things, <clears throat> and it kind of ties into a, a, probably another topic for us to kind of, uh, go down, but, um, you know, with nowadays with labor being harder to find, um, and, and, and trying to find skilled labor, um, which isn't too new for us. We've been dealing with that for a long time. Um, no one really seems to want to talk about just how many or how, how many lack of manager, good managers are all out there and, and people trying to really spend time focusing on themselves as managers and how am I going to get the most out of people? Um, you know, how many classes are they taking? Are they going to training? Uh, what are they doing to become a better manager? You don't really hear too many people talking about that side of things. And uh, we, we spend a ton of time in our training really focusing on that. And it's also part of our training package kind of in year three or four when you have four or five employees and you're starting to kind of build that really solid business, that's when we really want to have those discussions. So the ability to lead and manage teams. Yeah. I think everybody might be looking for those guys, <laughs> but it's so true. I mean, it's, that's, that's what we're all in it for. And that's what a lot of true entrepreneurs are, are in good businesses for. I had a, I had a question, Zach. What um, yeah. are you, your family, like your parents, are they entrepreneurs or, or it's like, where did you learn all this school? Like you seem like you've really got a great handle on, on business. So where is it intuitive? Where, where is it coming from? Um, yeah, that, there's, so my dad, he's, he's always worked for larger manufacturing companies. Um, he's always, he's dabbled in a few, few businesses. Uh, he actually, he is one of the owners of kitchen solvers right now. Um, so he's also got his hands in some of this. Um, but he wasn't like a serial entrepreneur by any means. Um, we have a lot of great conversations about what, what's out, what else could we be doing and what else is out there. Um, but a lot of it, I think is just kind of just that, that, uh, more passion to grow and then also just understanding humans and, and understanding people. Uh, I'm a big people person and I like to, to motivate and influence people. And I think just being able to teach that and then also kind of uh, build teams is something I'm just really passionate about. Um, and so when I have franchises, it's not like I have all these little micro teams that I can help lead and, and, uh, and, and try to see what else I can kind of pull from them to, to flourish. It's just a, a more or less a passion than it is, I think, more so for people than it is about building businesses for me. Huh. Cool. Yeah, that, that's awesome. So it sounds like you're the ideal franchisee, right? People that are <laughs> very similar to you. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And that, that, I mean, that's what it kind of seems like. I've been, uh, we've been bringing a lot of my own buddies. <laughs> it's like when we, a lot of our franchise that's partners, cool. they, we just all had, we all share the same type of culture. And, uh, you know, we look forward to our, our, our conventions year. We have a great time. Uh, that's just, there's almost like a common theme across all of our franchise partners that we are all sharing ideas and having fun together. And, uh, to me, that's, that's, that's one of the coolest parts about franchising. Life, life is short. If, if you're going to work as hard as you work as a, as a, you know, an entrepreneur or a franchisee, mm -hmm. you should be around the people you like. I, um, I disagree with that whole idea that like, um, don't do, what's the saying? Don't do business with your, your friends. I, I don't, I've never had an issue with, um, doing business with my, my friends. It's, uh, it's like some people play basketball, you know, we, we do business together. It's like our, our yeah. uh, yeah. common interest, uh, that's cool that you got. How many franchisees are are, are friends of yours? Oh, well, it's, it's I, know, a, I might have said question. that backwards, but like people coming into the system, I don't know them prior, but we become very good friends throughout this entire process, and they become my buddies at some point. <laughs> so it's a. Uh, I thought I you were recruiting any, your college, you know, uh, no, college buddies uh, into. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're they're fools for not being a, a part of Kitchen Solvers, but no, I, they're all like when they, once they <laughs> once they become franchisees. Like we spend so much time with them, we get to know their families and and their their goals and their skill sets, and then we we go visit them in their locations, and and they really do become true friends of ours. You know, I was texting late last night with a, a one of our franchise partners, just kind of just, hey, how's the family going? What's you know what's going on? Uh, nothing really work related, but that's just the type of relationships we end up building with a lot of our franchise partners. Yeah, I, I struggled with that. Oh, sorry, Christian, I struggled with that um, in the. The past company that I sold, I, I was like, 
I, I must have had like three friends, like actual friends that worked in sales in the company, and then friends of their friends and referrals from old companies and friends. Like I had like a, a true like uh, family kind of atmosphere, and that was something I struggled with, which was like, wow, I have to, I have to understand that uh, this is mm-hmm. part of the, you know, part of the. You can't have both, right? So, um, but now I'm just recruiting other friends. I got other other uh, college <laughs> friends in my network. It's relationship, so. yeah, relationship building and uh, and very emotional as well. Yeah, there's one woman I keep reaching out to. She's listening. I text her every six months. <laughs> I'm like, you ready to work with me yet or no? And she said someday she'll say yes. Someday. <laughs> it's funny though. Not going to stop I, trying, Paula. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's that's often a benefit of franchising that is not talked about enough is just the sense of community that it, that it brings. Whereas if you start your own independent business, you can build that within your within mm-hmm. your company. But it's so nice to have that <clears throat> network of other franchisees. You have the corporate team. You have all the other franchisees, their people, their employees, their teammates. And not only can you share best business practices and here's things you should do. Here's things you should probably not do. Here's how to get through these next challenges, this market that we're in, whatever the case is. But even beyond that, just the friendships. Because – if you're on your own island, it can get very lonely, especially as an entrepreneur that's leading everything. Mm-hmm. So it's nice to be able to talk to other people that are in your exact same situation in the same business, same franchise in different parts of the country. And again, not just share notes, but really just build friendships and be in the trenches together and and uh, watch each other grow. I, I don't think there's anything more fun than that. Yeah. Yeah. To speak like directly to that and with the uh, kitchen stars being a very established brand uh, and also <clears throat> having that, that culture that's already re- kind of re- is very strong uh, from the, our, our home office team to our franchises. We host a, a Friday call every single Friday at 8 a.m. Central and anybody that wants to join the call can jump on it. We'll post a topic uh, usually the Wednesday before And this is a time for our franchise partners to get on. We might have maybe 10 minutes of content, but then we just kind of open things up and allow the franchise partners to learn from each other. You know, we can sit there and push push new topics and push new procedures all day long. Uh, but until like a franchise partner says, hey, I, I have this new well, I tried out the new vendor. Uh, this was my experience. And all of a sudden that communication across the board is what really allows everybody else to kind of flourish. Um, but having that sense of, of team, uh, the kind of family oriented type of feeling that we re- that we really portray uh, just leads these Friday calls to be such a powerful tool uh, for our franchisees to grow. And so we, we stick to that Friday call every single Friday. Uh, we're, we're, we're there with a topic and it's been something that we've been consistently doing for about six or seven years. Wow. Consistency is key. So oh, on that 100%. note, so you have the. You have the 8 a.m. call on uh, Fridays. <laughs> what uh, what does the owner typically do the rest of the week? What is a day in the life of, a, of an owner look <laughs> right. like? I guess I guess what, from when they're initially starting out, and then once they kind of get to a point of, you know, they have their team that's kind of built. Yeah. Besides waiting for the Friday call, uh, their uh, their their day to day does change quite a bit. Um, where <clears throat> um, initially a, a new franchise owner is spending a lot of time uh, in those early stages, uh, building their team. Um, most of the time they take on kind of a, a sales type personality uh, where they are the ones kind of going out there trying to make that first sale. Uh, so their hours might be a little kind of wonky trying to fit into a customer's schedule. Um, usually starting off too, you have to be a little bit more flexible and when that schedule is set with your customers. Um, and we pay attention to <clears throat> the analytics of the business in the first three to three to six months. And to me, that is the most important stage for, for every new kitchen solvers. Um, it takes a little bit to kind of get that first sale, but because we are a large ticket, we get a lot of profit out of that first sale. And so if we're, if we're struggling or we're even selling too much in those first uh, uh, three to six months, we have to kind of step in and, and, and provide some, some type of relief and or uh, 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 coaching or, or help. <clears throat> so once, once they get to a point where they're selling consistently and they are, are selling, a, uh, hitting their kind of the break even numbers um, and able to then start building that team in, uh, their role as, as a kitchen sellers franchisee is, is then to kind of manage. And you might kind of find yourselves, depending on your strengths as a as an owner and also your weaknesses, you might find yourself being more operationally oriented or or more sales oriented. And usually, then you're sur- surrounding yourself with people that kind of uh, are doing the stuff that you don't necessarily want to. 
<clears throat> our franchise owners are not installing that we don't want them uh, installing in the kitchens, but they need to understand how uh, so that they can be better managers. Um, and so we want them within within that year uh, to really kind of step back, start managing and, and hiring a, a couple of good solid people. So it's a little bit of a there's definitely a big learning curve, uh, especially with kitchens and a lot of kind of things that happen within that kitchen. Uh, but that goal is always to keep finding people to remove yourself from the business as early as possible. Excellent. Well, thank you for, for sharing all things kitchen solvers. Any, anything else you want to share with our, our audience who's, who's listening? I, I mean, Nothing, nothing too specific. I mean, uh, uh, kitchen solvers again, just kind of wrap things up. I mean, we're, we're an established brand that that really focuses on the culture of our our franchisees, uh, and it's top down approach from our home office. Every single one of our employees matches the same culture. We're all kind of entrepreneurial at heart. Uh, we want to be able to to coach and and lead our franchise uh, partners into into their success. And so we spend a lot of time really focusing on that, building in new systems to make things easier for our franchise partners uh, and, and really allowing them to, to flourish for whatever their goal may be within the system. So, <clears throat> um, and that, that's, that's a kind of kitchen solvers in a nutshell. Love it. Awesome, man. Well, Zach, thanks so much for coming on, man. Uh, kitchen solvers, fantastic brand. Really appreciate what you're doing over there. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in to another episode. Make sure to, Subscribe, share, leave a review, all that good stuff. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Franchise Founders Podcast. If you want our help with anything from buying a franchise to franchising your business to anything in between, shoot us an email at franchisefounders at gmail.com.